Uh, let's start. <laughs> Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It's the 12th, I think, of October 2011, and we have, uh, as I've announced... Asked before she came on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was. I'll take it. <laughs> you I'll do what? Somebody take credit for that. Actually, Catherine published something um, a, a year and a half ago or so called Wacky Ideas, and that's where I got the word wacky. Uh, uh, Catherine, do so, why don't we go with the flow here and you introduce yourself quickly and tell us what those wacky ideas were. That's one way to, to start. Oh, sure, sure. So um, I, I really have two jobs. One is um, innovation consulting in higher education. And um, that's you know been 18, more than 18 years of strategic innovation consulting with Fortune 500s. And three years ago, started doing innovation consulting in higher ed. So um, one of the first projects that we did was funded by CEOs for Cities and the Lumina Foundation. And that was called um, 101 Wacky Ideas for Reinventing Higher Education. And uh, in that process, we researched um, students who were um, at risk of failing out or dropping out, or those who had already dropped out or failed out to understand what the truth was about why they struggle. And, um, you know, the mythology was that if we just gave them money um, and access, they would graduate. And that's, of course, not true. So we, um, we did a lot of ethnographic research and really sought to understand what are the personas and, the, and problems that students face today, um, which I could get into. But ultimately, out of that, we developed this framework and um, actually hundreds of ideas, but we prioritize them into the top 101 that would be provocative, um, actually totally possible, but probably unthinkable for most universities. That and beyond that, still consulting and doing some really great reimagination of higher education with our universities. And also building a platform called Rad Matter, which is um, intended to make uh, college a better experience. Tell us what Rad Matter, your slogan. Life is rad, make it matter. And, uh, and it's true. I think what we found was that we really need to crank up the passion and make one of the biggest problems we've heard from students is that they feel education is so disconnected from real life. Um, the professors that they have haven't worked in the field. Um, the, the things that they're studying don't really make sense to them and they're a little bit lost. So um, the more real we can make their education and give them some application for the theory that they're learning in a traditional university, the better their chances are of actually completing. And I, I think completion is a big issue for those who want to complete college. And um, for those who just want to go in and challenge themselves and really discover their talents and master their talents, they can do that as well. It doesn't have to be about a degree. Cool. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And Monica, I hop. Is it me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you mean that's the loud sound? It might be. I don't yeah. know who it is. Yeah, it is you. I've been trying to mute people to see who it was. Is it me? It is you. <laughs> yeah, it's Seriously? you. Seriously? It's okay. <laughs> it's gone now, whatever Okay, it is. bye. No, no, it's gone. gone. <laughs> whatever it's gone. Oh, wait, you're... Oh. I think it might be Chris, too, because he's muted right now. Yeah, it's you, Chris. Could be me. Yeah, yeah I haven't done you. anything different. It's okay. Can you still hear me? It's Chris who has broccoli on his teeth. That's uh, the metaphor we're uh, using. okay. <laughs> anyway. I'm jealous. I'll tell broccoli. you about that metaphor another day. Anyway, <laughs> you know. I, I wanted to define wacky there, and I think you did a great job, mm -hmm. Catherine, um, by saying something about uh, absolutely doable ideas, but ideas that are hard for, I don't know, how did you, you said it so well, hard for some people to imagine <laughs> doing, at least in traditional settings. Um, Somewhat so unthinkable. I mean, the, the obvious ones are sort of addressing things like tenure, which has been, you know, an area of strife for professors against administrations and what have you. But a lot of the ideas are things like um, 
trying to bring uh, college to students as opposed to students going to college and using some of the city space that we have. Like movie theaters are empty every day until noon or one o'clock. Why couldn't we have um, webcasted or, or you know, use, use their movie theaters as classrooms um, for our citizens to stop in, drop in, and um, catch a course? We could or occupy meet up, them, um, so to speak. Sorry? We could occupy them. Just to use We can our, occupy them. That's just right. Just That's the right. Um, so, I mean, they're. I like that idea. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, there are a lot of like really doable and, and terrific ideas in there. And actually, um, we did uh, a bit of evangelism with 40 of the, I'd say, the most maverick chancellors and presidents um, in the country and um, got a lot of support from the ideas. I think that in many cases, their hands are tied by politics, poli uh, by policy and um, and budgetary restraints, and and actually, we made a lot of we made the case for how to fund a lot of these ideas, and that always required sort of okay, drop this program to start this other one, or you know, sort of you need to change multiple things in order to make the financial model work. Um, so, like one of the things we were talking about is that fraternities and sororities are sort of an outdated model, and a lot of students today aren't really interested and aren't taking advantage of those. Um, and there's a lot of finance, there's a lot of um, time, energy, and money put into those organizations. Same with sports. Um, as much as a lot of people love sports, there are still many more students who aren't at all. That's a problem that isn't even relevant. But there's not an alternative version of a community activity like that. So um, we need to think about who's not being served and how much money we're spending on stadiums and you know, just entertainment activities as opposed to real learning communities. So trying to take away a football team is not the easiest thing to do, but it might be the right thing to do if you care about completion. Uh, okay, so, so Catherine, thank you for that introduction <laughs> here. Uh, but Monica, maybe you could introduce the other folks here and invite people to just keep interrupting so it's not back and forth with me or you and a guest or something. So we have a real okay, conversation uh, here. Go for it. I'm gonna have I'm gonna have Lisa take a go here. And I'm gonna have you guys introduce yourselves. So Lisa, you go. Okay, so my name is Lisa Nielsen and I have a blog called The Innovative Educator. And I just recently published a book called Teaching Generation Tech. And I'm pretty outspoken uh, as far as being an advocate for what is right and best for students, which sometimes gets me in trouble because that's not always right and best for adults. Um, in fact, I will have a post along these lines on Friday on my blog. And um, I, I guess I'm just always very fearless in uh, standing up for giving students the freedom to learn in whatever way that is possible. Um, the book that I wrote talks about thinking outside the ban and empowering students with uh, the tools to learn in the way that they learn best. And in places like where I work, they are, students are treated like criminals with random suites with metal detectors um, where their personal digital devices are confiscated from them. And these are the sort of things that I speak out against, things like that passion-driven learning and, and all of those sort of things. Um, I'm really interested in Rad Matter. I am friendly with Dale Stevens, and I'm really excited to uh, learn more about what that work is as well today. Super. So that's me. Great. Thank you. Um, Alex and Phil, why don't you guys go ahead? Uh, sure. My name why, don't you, is why don't you introduce each other? All right. Uh, yes. Uh, I like that. All right. So this is Alex, my brother. Um, he recently started a company called Our School. And from what I know of it, it essentially uh, focuses on peer led social learning, where it takes the uh, onus away from institutions and basically puts on learning into the community and within your social network. 
and your, I guess, concrete network, if we're talking about, like, within a city. And uh, we teach short classes um, that anybody can take. The goal being that uh, transferring education from a passive learning to yourself teaching empowers people. And they're rocking that out. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, and this here is Phil. Um, Phil just wrote a book uh, that is out now. Um, uh, a bit of a, a story about him um, and his dealings getting through high school and college with ADHD. Um, a lot of tips and tricks about what he did to go from someone who really wasn't interested in school um, and didn't uh, really vibe with the system to someone who figured out a way to sort of flip his, what was, you know, given to him as a condition um, and flip it and use it as an advantage uh, and really end up excelling in school um, and sort of a how-to uh, advice book, things like that. That's great. Thanks, guys. Jode Beer, are you there? Jod Beer um, may pop in. He's um, originally from India. He's been helping with the lab. We got a visit from him for about 10 days, not too long ago. Um, and he just recently has found out he gets to go back to India. So he may he may not show up tonight. Um, I, I'd like to just add here that um, from our what we've been doing the last three or four years, um, the biggest thing that we see is what people need are spaces of permission to be. You know, and if we can help create those spaces of permission, be it through, dang, let's let them use their cell phones, or, um, you know, let's connect them to a, a business in the future as opposed to go through all the policy and everything. If they have a, a more streamlined, if we can connect the people as opposed to doing things as we always have. And then with Alex and um, Bill, the, the idea of that rhizomatic learning and rhizomatic expertise and, you know, who is the learner and who is the teacher and maybe it's all in, all in the same. So I absolutely love that you guys are all here. Um, definitely want to give time to both both ideas there and I, I think Lisa will be a good MC person for this as well. Um, but why don't you, Lisa, ask some questions that you have about Rad Matter to um, Catherine. How about that? Sure. Um, I, I definitely have some questions. I first heard about it from Dale Stevens, and then I, I investigated a little further. But I think I had one misconception, um, but I hope that it's something that can happen. One thing that I thought Rad Matter was going to be able to do was um, allow you to credential yourself. So that instead of having to tie your credential to an institution who you pay, you can indicate, you could take classes from a variety of places or have real life experiences or do your own challenges. So one of the things I thought that was going to be was that, and I'm wondering if that is in the future of Rad Matter. It is, you know, I think one of the things um, that's been hard for, it's been hard for, for me and it's hard for the team is to deconstruct the product to its very simplest core to get it launched. Um, we have such a, a, an amazing roadmap of where we'd like to go with this and what we, what, what we thought would happen sooner might have to happen later. In fact, we had our um, first version of the product completed this summer and did an internal test without anybody seeing it other than our team. And um, it wasn't fun. Like it was, it was a lot of work and we thought, Gosh, who's going to go through this like explaining and trying to credential themselves when it's such a chore and one of our design principles is challenges not chores so everything should be um, gameful and rewarding intrinsically um, in the process so we had to deconstruct a lot of things and we we reoriented the core of the product and now we've, we've got the next version and um, I, I can say as an, as an entrepreneur, that's a really exciting thing because, uh, and, it, and it follows learning, right? Like learning to fail and iterate and, and rapid prototyping, that's phenomenal. And um, we've been able to do that. But um, to answer your question, yes, we do think that students will credential themselves. And we also have um, 
an algorithm that will enable people to, what we'll, we'll just call it level up over time and, um, and provide credentials for each other. So oh my God, that's so exciting. One thing I think that's even more, I mean, that's great, and that's where everyone's questions are going to go straight to, but one thing I think that's even more powerful is the act of just connecting. You're, you're connecting the people, which, you, yeah, if you want the credentialing idea, it's there, but our main focus is life is rad, make it matter, let's not waste time with this in between that we think we have to do. So that's what I love about what you guys are doing. Thanks. Yeah, I, I was... It was interesting to find out what rad matter actually meant, and I really like that. But I also like the idea of taking power out of the hands of the university and putting it into the hands of the actual people. And I know, so, I mean, I'm, I just have all these people who come to mind who have been so stifled by the whole process of having to not have credits transfer and not have life experiences count, and even who have taught at college level but not had been able to get credit for those classes that they had taught for years. So I just love the idea of uh, empowering people with the ownership of credentialing themselves. I think that can be so unbelievably transformational and impactful. So I hope that happens and I would be very happy to help make that happen. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I should, we should get together and I'll, I'll show you um, where, where we're at and happy Great. to collaborate. Great connection. Um, Phil, talking about ownership, can you share a little bit about ownership that you've experienced and written about in your book? Ownership in terms of? Taking ownership. Well, you're saying how to get through college with ADHD. So, yeah. So essentially, um, I think one of the biggest things that kind of changed my outlook on just really anything, I was completely bored with school and uninspired and uh, thinking about dropping out more than once. Um, and I kind of started realizing there were these tiny things that I could do to like make my life easier in college. And that it's might sound ridiculous, but it started with me finding a pen that actually my handwriting is semi-decent with. And uh, when I found that, it was one of those things where all of a sudden taking notes wasn't as much of a pain. And, you know, looking at the notes, looking at my handwriting wasn't so disgusting and awful. And so I kind of started finding out these tiny little things over the years, over the seven years, that uh, these small little things that I could kind of take and do, and it was transformative, and it actually kind of as I figured out what I wanted to learn in college, it kind of just changed how I looked at myself as not only a student, but also at the, as the act of learning. I don't really think that I had figured out how to learn appropriately until I was about 21. Um, I think back in elementary, middle, and high school, I pretty much just relied on uh, these standard techniques of attempting rote memory. Well, I mean, you know, it's fleeting. Um, oh, Paul, don't you want to know what kind of pen he got? <laughs> yeah. Sure, what kind yeah, of pen? I, 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 what's the pen? Whoa. What's the pen? It was called the Pilot Execugel. Right. And they don't, they discontinued it like two years ago. I should have stashed them up. Oh, I thought maybe they were paying for your book publishing. God, no, no, no. Um, can, I, can I jump in for one second? Please. Please. Um, well, there is a pen that does that called the Live Scribe pen now. We give it to some of our tech coaches. But one of the things I just was writing in the chat is I don't think that teachers should require students to take notes. I think every student should be given notes in advance of a lecture. And, um, and I think that, well, now I'll be a little provocative, but I think it's really lazy for a professor or a teacher to require anyone to take notes. That information should be given to you in advance or you should know that you can listen to the lecture afterwards because the teacher has either video or audio taped it. So, um, yeah, I and I understand that you had to do that, but I think that it's unfortunate that you were put in that position. No, I, I mean, we had, uh, I remember 
later in the years in college, we had our lectures online and all that. Um, and, you know, the university that I went to, Michigan State, of uh, bullet points from PowerPoint slides throughout the and entire you know, That's the other thing. I mean, I know it relates to the flipped classroom and whatnot, but um, it also was in Rodney Dangerfield's movie a long time ago where eventually um, the whole classroom was just a bunch of tape recorders there's no need for you to go listen to a lecture right i i you should just get the transcribed uh you should get a video and the transcription and then uh students should have the time to go do stuff that's meaningful rather than wasting their time coming together in a place and a lot of times i just wrote an article about this um i was there was an article in usa today that I was quoted in about the whole flipped classroom idea. And the teachers, teachers say, you know, it's so important to listen to us speak because we can connect with students when they have questions and whatnot. But the fact is often they're just sitting there lecturing and they're not actually taking questions from students or giving some smart back channel option. And I think that all of that lecture and note type stuff can be done more effectively without requiring you I mean, I'm also talking from my own personal resentment of being required to sit there and be bored off my ass, literally, for yeah. hours. So, do you guys know about um, Western Governors University? I, you, uh, you, no. Okay, so um, it was it's wgu.edu, and they were founded um, probably 14 years ago now uh, by 17 governors of Western states. And it's an, it's an entirely online and nonprofit university. They graduate more math and science teachers than any other school in the country. And um, it costs uh, exactly what a Pell Grant will give you for the year. And you can actually go at your own pace as fast as you want to go. Um, if you are someone, let's say, who's a nurse who's been working in the field, um, you don't have to take a single course if you can pass the assessments. So it's completely capability based and not, not you know, Carnegie, Carnegie credit hours based. And um, they have real working professionals as mentors. They don't have professors. Um, although I think some of the mentors are PhDs from various, you know, they've, they've been recruited from other universities. But all the content is online, and students can do what you know what they need to do to get through and the mentor is there if they need some help. And uh, I mean, just, it's an amazing school and they're targeting sort of the most underserved population and they're doing exceptionally well with it. Just, it would be, so, they've been a client and, and um, one of my favorite sort of administrations to think with, Bob Mendenhall's the president, he's just phenomenal, so. Hey Paul, tell us some about student voices I, well, instead of that, can I, I wanted to re redirect back to Catherine and ask about um, board college students, if we could, for a second. Because I, I hear it coming up from Phil, and I, I think you, you've mentioned that in your ethnographic studies. Can you open that up a little bit? Like, it's not enough just to say that college students were bored. Um, is there a right. way to... Can you well, explain that a little more? Right, and, and actually, I don't. I, none of our personas were about boredom. Um, there were people who didn't understand why they were there. Um, there were students who um, couldn't connect with a community and therefore um, didn't really have a support system. There are a lot of other issues, but boredom was sort of is like it, it's the um, symptom. It's not. It's yeah. not the actual problem, and you know what we found we in our in our learning archetypes at the college level we found we found really three archetypes. One is the sprinter, one's the trooper, and one's the voyager. And um, the sprinter is someone who wants to get through really fast, and they're not 
you know, they want the piece of paper. And in many cases, a boss said they don't get a promotion unless they get it, or you know, they're just so eager to get out in the real world that they just, they're not even really interested in being there, but they're there. Um, and you can be a great sprinter. You can just go right through. Um, unfortunately, a lot of students who want to be sprinters or who are naturally sprinters don't sprint very well. Um, and that's a problem. So you could call that boredom, but it's actually more that they've got other goals that aren't really um, related to university. The true for someone who really just wants to do exactly what is required and told. So they need a map. They need the professor to tell them this is exactly what you're going to do. Um, and they will go through every detail. They'll, they'll you know, dot all the I's and cross all the T's. Um, and you would think that most universities or traditional education um, educators would love these students because they really will just do everything rigorously. But the problem is that um, they go to the extreme and they're very meticulous. And they can often get so so in, um, involved with the with the details that they're losing sight of what the education is about. So um, we saw students where they were just rewriting. To your point about notes, rewriting an entire book. They weren't they weren't required to do that. They just were doing it because they thought that's what they were supposed to do, or um, you know, sort of had this idea that that was what being thorough means. Um, so the, the details kind of got them caught up. And finally, the Voyager, and I think this is the point, like Voyagers are the ones who really want, they're thirsty for knowledge and they want to run and explore and notice. And um, they're probably, you know, people who can get completely absorbed in a topic. Um, the problem with them is that they can get distracted really easily. So it's not, it's not necessarily boredom, it's that they move on to something else. And it's really tough for a university to create this experience that's going to um, be able to serve all these archetypes and also a student who might be all three of those archetypes in one because, you know, when they're in math, they're a sprinter because they don't like it. And when they're in psychology, they're a voyager because they're totally infatuated with it. So. I don't really know. I think it's the same thing as money. Students will say, oh, you know, I can't afford college. That's not really the truth. I mean, the, or put it this way. Money is not the problem, and I don't think boredom is the problem. I think it's just the same thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Those are really helpful. Phil, I was wondering if uh, those categories fit your experience? Yeah, they sound, uh, I like the fact that they're not mutually exclusive to just one person. I like that you can kind of have uh, a part of yourself in each category depending on topic, subject, and probably where you are in your life. Uh, I think that Voyager would probably be the, be the best one for me. I spent a lot of time go really getting into something for six months and then leaving that and going to something else for six months um, really subject wise I think that was kind of what led me around a full circle in school you know one one thing I, I think is kind of interesting here is that um, with the our school platform one of our big goals is turning students into teachers and the notion that everyone really can be a teacher and uh, we're finding a lot of similarities to what you are talking about in teachers where there's a lot of people think you know teacher is standing up in front of a classroom giving a lecture and really teacher and sharing knowledge can take a ton of different forms and it's kind of once you start describing those different forms to people the same way you're talking about the different kinds of students um, that people start understanding more about the ways they can share knowledge back um, and I think those those sort of different ways of doing that. It's kind of neat to see it on on both sides, you know, from the students and the teachers. Can you describe your favorite class on our school, or a couple of classes that have happened already? Uh, Just yeah, I mean, sense of what um, look like. my I I would say the the best classes that we've had so far um, really have nothing to do with the subject matter of the class, but uh, have everything to do with the class dynamic. Um, they are classes where everybody meets somebody they haven't met before. Everybody has someone that they've already met. Um, so a group.
Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, same kind of thing where you you feel comfortable because you're there with somebody you know. You brought a friend, or you might know the teacher, or something like that. But you also uh, are able to meet some new people. Um, the slightly more formal setting than just a bunch of friends hanging out. So there is actually knowledge shared. There is a structure to it which allows people to kind of do their thing. Um, and they become really sort of supportive, good interactions where at the end of it, everyone is, you know, asking for more. Um, those, are, those are the best classes we have, for sure. And, the, and the, you know, the subject matters of those classes really can be anything from, you know, learning JavaScript and programming Ruby on Rails to uh, we had a Ethereal. Um, eager to learn, meet new people, all that stuff. So, really about the people. The classes last just as long as they need to last. They come and go. Is that? Yeah. Um, yeah. We we sort of use the analogy of an hour. So it's hour school, H O U R. But um, that it's you know it's all about bite sized learning. It's learning that fits your schedule, your time. Um, so classes, you know, most of our classes are an hour, but we've had classes that are all day. We've had classes that are repeating, you know, you know, five or six sessions over a week. So that's just a, it's just more a mentality than an actual structure for the class. So that, that kind of depends on the subject. I'm waiting for others to jump in. Go, <laughs> go ahead. Why don't you go ahead and share, um, you're getting ready to launch another beta or another phase, and how could people help you? Um, I mean, I know more people being involved is going to be helpful to you. So, you yeah, I, mean, I think you know a lot of the um, as we launch the next site, there's going to be a lot more interaction, especially for people from. So right now we're launched in Austin and in San Francisco, and we're trying to expand that a little bit. Um, the current site doesn't really have a ton of ability to work for people not in Austin or San Francisco. So we're working on that. Um, hopefully that'll get a little bit better as we move. But really it's just more about uh, opening up the dialogue, getting people talking about the idea that, you know, th this is about learning, not about, you know, an institution. This is about currently there is unbelievable. Um, and being able to really tap that knowledge is a, a really interesting thing that we're trying to get people to talk about. So. Um, you know, that's how the probably the biggest way people can help is by start having Starting to have those discussions about tapping that knowledge of their social networks, about um, you know the fact that the classroom can be anywhere, whether it's a movie theater or the cafe or you're you know uh, around a dinner table. Um, so those kind of things are good ways to help. And come by the site, <laughs> check it out. What is that the same site? It How will be. The, it will be the same site. Yeah, we're, we should launch uh, the new version probably at the beginning of November. Um, will be. Cool. The new version, so it'll be a little, a little bit more. So what we're finding as well, very Plasherkian um, cognitive surplus, that it's all about the conversation, and whether it's virtually or locally, just talking to people and finding out that um, the publicly prescribed learning has made us think that the only way to learn is through teaching, and when actually um, through conversation and you know being involved yourself and owning it yourself is a much better way uh, to learn. So, or for most, for most of the people that, I mean, Seth Godin's most recent book, That We Are All Weird, from, we've been thinking that we're the abnormal ones when, you know, like we're, we're seeing with Occupy, wherever, really 99% of the people are the ones that we've been labeling as abnormal, you know? And you gotta start questioning all these labels we've put on people over the years just because they didn't fit that little box of normal. Um, so this is all very unleashing, um, loving it.
And it's all so simple about conversation and connections. Lisa, do you have any more? You. Um, yeah, I guess I always have stuff. Um, I think for me, I never, I didn't learn, well, I tell people this and it's really true. Some people don't believe it, but I didn't learn anything in school. I didn't learn anything in pre-K to 12 and I didn't learn anything in college. So I have this great resentment that all of that time was wasted. Um, and I, I just don't learn the way that school requires us to learn. However, Lisa, I did get, Lisa, you know, I, I graduated I wonder... at the top of my class for um, high school and for college, but I still didn't learn anything. And then I graduated embarrassed because I didn't know anything. And I also, um, as some people who have read my blog know, finished school quickly at 19 without knowing anything and without having any idea what I was going to do next. So that I makes... Was gonna... You know, I, I did ask, all the things, I jumped through all the hoops, and it makes people like me upset. You know what, Lisa, I think it's huge what you said, um, that I graduated, oh, you're going to have to say it again, I, at the top of my class and embarrassed that I didn't know anything. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge statement because, like, what, what we're doing, you know, alternative ways to learn, people think it's for, you know, people who aren't successful. Well, there's mm -hmm. just as many 4.0s that are just as dissatisfied, you yeah. know, and the feeling of they're honoring me and I'm embarrassed because I don't know anything, which isn't right. true. It's, that's not true right there, but you don't know what they're, what they're saying, you know, by the paper that they're handing you. You don't know all that. You, you can. Well, actually it, I really don't know. I don't know anything that I learned. Like I don't really learn by memorizing and regurgitating. I left everything right. on the test papers. I don't know history. I don't know science. I don't know algebra, geometry, I myself and get back in touch with those things because I was so turned off from things like reading and writing because I was told what to read and what to think about what I read and all of my writing uh, was turned back with criticism and I had this belief that I, that um, the teachers should actually turn back my writing and let me keep turning it in until it was done for a perfect day and they didn't all agree with that. They didn't think that was their job and we got in a lot of about that but I really I really didn't learn anything in school and I really have like very I don't I'm not knowledgeable about any of those things school was supposed to help me become knowledgeable about expose me to and they also say we need to expose kids to all these things so they can know what they love but exposing me to all these things made me hate things that I loved hmm. so it's frustrating <laughs> think that when I was bored I think that was one of my big experiences was just simply understanding that I had the ability to alter the way that I learn, like in a way that worked for me, taking it from other people's ideas and techniques of how you're supposed to learn into my own hands that like I was no longer spending 40 wasted hours studying for something because it was just not working after years and years and years that I could do something in three three hours that was more efficient and better in every other way, resulted in better grades, resulted in all, all and also resulted in retention of information. Which Yeah, see the huge. the thing that confused me was I was I actually I was an actress as a child. I was really good at memorizing and regurgitating. So I thought I was doing well and I thought I was learning. I didn't realize agitation meant success. So I didn't know, um, like you're saying, you learn, you knew that you needed to learn. I thought that was learning. I thought getting A's right. was learning, right. yeah. doing well on tests was learning. But in fact, I never remembered anything after, after mm -hmm. I took the test. So, where, so, can I so my question is, where is the point that like, what is, what causes the epiphany in kids that like, this is not working, this is not learning for me. And where can we, where, where does that next step? to let them know that like you can find out your own way to learn if you want, if you, yeah. you know? I, I think a lot of it ha has to do with parents. I mean, it, the, of course, this depends on which, which age group, but I mean, I was very fortunate to grow up with a mom who was an, um, you know, K through three teacher and, um, and, and I have ADD, so, um, you know, she never told me because she thought it was a strength. 
and um, she really did, and she and she knew a lot of kids like that, and thought it was really cool. So, um, you know, when I didn't want to do my homework and I thought it was stupid, she did it for me because she knew that getting the grade and getting through school was important for society. So she was like, you know, I remember her just like, you know, I ha we'd have discussions, and I'd say, I'm not going to write down and memorize all the state capitals because that's a stupid thing to do. And she'd say, that's right, and do the homework. And then, you know, we'd come up with something else that I wanted to do. Or, um, and really negotiated with the teachers that, um, I mean, I had one class where it was like a biology class, and I can't take a multiple choice test for the life of me. I'm just terrible at it. And, uh, you know, we worked out a deal that I had an A for the class, and I didn't have to take any tests at all. Like, as soon as he figured out my you know, my style, he was like, you know, you just come in every week and do a project. We won't tell anyone. And but I, I think um, what the problem is, is like when there's are and there's many people like me, I didn't have a problem. I did well on my test. I, I didn't know I wasn't learning. Um, I did all our parents are brainwashed to believe that if you do well on tests and get good grades, you're going to learn and succeed. And now we have uh, all this Occupy Wall Street and this and that. And I think it has a ton to do with the fact that we didn't actually teach anyone that succeeding in school, like I succeeded. I didn't need any tricks. I thought I did what I was supposed to. All these people have done what they were supposed to, but have not been empowered to know what their passions are. And also the idea that everyone needs to work for someone else is something that you know, we're taught in school compliance not to question authority, and we're taught all the lessons that don't make us successful in the 21st century. Everything you need to do to be awesome in school makes you unprepared for success in the real world that you graduate into. And that was my frustration. I did it all, and I did it quick, and I didn't know what I wanted to do next, and I didn't learn anything. But I didn't know that, nor did my parents who are intelligent people, but they didn't know because all the indicators, all the data said I was smart and I was going to succeed. I mean, I, I would, I would, um, I think that the thing I guess that I'm thinking about when you say stuff like that is that it, it is really, the, the biggest problem is that it's an individual thing and it's an individual thing in every situation. You know, my brother and I, same parents, same school, two completely different experiences, right? right. Um, two completely different experiences. Um, I had a wonderful time. I learned a ton, and I had a lot of teachers that taught me to challenge the system and to challenge, you know, the status quo and all that stuff. And I identified with them, and I'm still friends with them today. Um, and it's not that there's one way or the other. It's more about, you know, how we can figure out how to get more people to think. about learning uh, as the goal as opposed to you know these things like you're talking about grades and certificates and and all that kind of stuff um, one thing I'm wondering I I've seen it a lot in um, kind of in professionally in the field that I'm in in design um, and in sort of the startup world where a lot of the companies I work with and the people I work around uh, the whole notion of a degree is kind of disappearing or the value of open and willing to learn over anyone with a degree anytime. Um, and I'm wondering if you guys see that in other fields. I know that is not, you know, something that, that works across the board, but it's definitely something that I'm seeing uh, where I am, where it's, it's all about what you can do effectively in a company. And it has very little to do with where you went to school or what you learned and those kind of things. I agree with, I agree with uh, Alex. Um, I got hired by 3M India just because of, because of this thing. Uh, I have a degree in electrical engineering. They are hiring for manufacturing. They didn't ask me any a single question, technical question. They just asked me uh, about describe yourself. That's it. That was the one question they asked me. And I didn't talk about my degree in that question. That's it. So I, I'm quite convinced with your point that this is the case. That some companies who are into the innovation or mainly you know the forward-looking companies 
they are looking beyond degree. However, um, coming back to your earlier point uh, about this passion thing that we all were talking about and not learning from school, uh, I have this case study. I think you guys can help me with that. And it's actually my sister. She's near. She's 20. She's uh, she's in her last year in college, and from the very first year, I had told her that she has to find her passion, and she was trying to understand like this system isn't working. She was quite convinced by the second year this is not working, and grades means nothing to her. Anyways, now be, the thing is, um, it, once you once a person understands that okay this isn't working, I need to find a passion. I told her there's a, another option of unschooling. And now the, the thing that we are trying, me and my sister, we are trying is having her different experiences, unplanned experiences that she she would never think of. For example, for 20 days, she worked in a call center in India, just for 20 days, just for the sake of having experience. Because at this moment, she doesn't know what to do in life. And now um, uh, by 16, she will be going to for an internship program for about which she doesn't know what she has to do. It's it's a, it's a self-directed um, internship program. I don't know either much about it, but it's with the uh, Manish Jain's organization, who is uh, in the Schooling the World documentary, and um, and she doesn't know anything. So my question to all of you is, if she can help me, the thing, um, I I know it's more of an individual experience that one finds his or her passion, but could there be couple of ways that one can look into one when one realizes that okay I need to find out what to do in my life I, I think one of the problems especially here in the United States where we're moving toward narrowing the curriculum and a one-size curriculum for all is there is no place for passion-driven learning uh, or even to you know I, I went all the way from high school through college without any teacher having any idea what my passions, talents, or interests were. So until that becomes important, um, I think this is always going to be an issue. And mm -hmm. until it becomes honored, it's going to be an issue. Yeah, I think um, you, one of the things, uh, you know, like I was saying before, I had a, I learned a lot in high school and had a, had a good time in high school. Um, but I went to my freshman year of college, did had a great time, did terrible, uh, and felt like I wasn't learning anything and immediately dropped out after the first year and took a year off. And that was where um, I really learned, you know, about what my passions were and the things that I wanted to do and stuff like that. And it was sort of, um, you know, it was the thing that every single person told me not to do um, and kind of the thing that, that really changed uh, the direction of my life, I think. And um, being able to identify that for myself, I about you know the the unplanned experience and and really getting out there it was I had no idea at the beginning of the year where I would end up and you know by the end of that year had done a bunch of things I never could have you know dreamed about um, and it was all sort of unplanned um, and and not the way all of my friends were doing it and that's why it was incredible so I think there's something huge there with the you know the unplanned experience meeting people you don't expect to meet that you don't normally hang out with and travel with that will get you thinking and get you, you know, working on finding your passion, finding the things that you want to do and the things that you're interested in, for sure. One of mm -hmm. our 101 wacky ideas was to eliminate the freshman year and do exactly that. And gosh, that would save a lot of money for universities too, to, to and for stu students going, right? Like just let people go and explore and figure things out and they'll be much more successful when they get there. I'm also one of those who dropped out of college moved to Hawaii, lived on a beach, learned to surf, and was a waitress for a while. So, um, but we met lots of students, and the ones who were most successful were the ones who did take time off, who figured it out, and did go back. Unfortunately, I think what happens, a lot of people, I mean, the statistics are there, right? Like, uh, uh, of the population in your city, for instance, that has a college degree, every percentage point increase is a billion dollars in that economy. So if you can get in a place like Memphis, 8,000 people to graduate, it brings a billion dollars into that economy and into the pockets of the people who live there. So we shouldn't forget that that's very real. And, and to speak, because Rad Matter is very connected to the corporate side, and we talk always about students being job creators and not um, job seekers. Um, 
but companies want job creators. They want creative problem solvers. Uh, the systems kind of squish that out of people, but um, they're, they're struggling on the corporate side to figure out, you know, where do we find these great people? And you're right, they don't necessarily care about the degree because the degree doesn't tell them. On the other hand, there's something called OFCCP, which is a law that states that every company has to interview anybody with a like resume. So until you can eliminate the resume altogether or reinvent the resume, you're in trouble. Um, like Accenture, for instance, has paid millions and millions of dollars. If you have two people with the same thing on their resume, you have to interview both if you interview one. And just imagine, like, if so the way the reason why companies are using the college degree as sort of the basis or the door opener is it cuts off like a lot of the trouble um, and it's about efficiency unfortunately so I mean that's one of our goals with Rad Matter is to try to um, provide a different way for companies to differentiate between candidates that will um, kind of get around this OFCCP rule but if, if, if ever, like, there's, like, a hang-up, like, there, I've just learned so much about policy. There's so many stupid policies out there that companies have to deal with, and it drives the whole system. One of our, one of our focuses is um, a process of learning to learn, which, for those of you who know, we're calling detox. And it's basically um, self-reflection. And we're saying that is a huge missing piece in inte intellectual learning. And the thing that that needs for that to happen, though, is for us to take time. And anymore, what we're finding is everyone's reason for not doing things and changing is because they don't have time. So thinking back to your question, Judd Bear, of, of how, do we, how do we help people find their passion, I think, again, creating these spaces of permission to be, spaces for people to pause and believe that you want to know who they really are, you know, by by guiding them through self-reflection because we've gotten so far away from self-reflection we think we think reflection is what the grade was that you got on your test that you're soon going to throw away you know and that's how we reflect and we we haven't let people have that space in their minds or physical spaces to self-reflect i think too on that point in terms, Sorry, of, go ahead. Uh, in terms of finding like a passion i know from my own experience what like really changed one of the things uh, in my life was when I found passion for something that had nothing to do with school. Um, I got into boxing when I was 16 and at 19 I started competing as an amateur boxer and I was, it consumed my world and I excelled at it and after a shoulder injury derailed what was I was hoping to be a good career um, I kind of took a step back and through, you know, six months of rehab was th reassessing things. And I came to the conclusion that if I could do, take this transformation, which was somebody who hadn't done athletics in a few years and was just kind of getting back into it, into that feeling of self-empowerment based around a passion until that point in my life. mechanic or from gaming from so we studied world of warcraft to understand why are why can people play that for eight hours at a time and become guild masters but they can't get through school get through an algebra class um and one of the with respect to reflection one of the things that we loved was ghost mode so if you get killed if you fail hard enough you, you become black and white in the world of color, and you're a ghost, and you're allowed to walk around, and you can do everything. You can um, see how other people are playing. You can meet, but it's a time of self-reflection, and you have to sort of take that time out to think about what have I done wrong, and what do I need to learn to get to the next level. So it's it's ingrained. It's and I think we don't do enough of that. Um, make time for that and make it okay, that reflection time. I had um, a, a couple of thoughts just going back a little bit of a ways. Um, the, it, uh, quite a bit of a ways, but the college grads uh, statistics are really flawed. And I write about this a lot on my blog 
Um, we say that people who graduated college are earning more, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact is people who go into college already were at a higher socioeconomic status and the type of people who go into college already had parental involvement, et cetera. So it's not that college degree made you earn more money. It's the type of people who go into college and there's a whole bunch of other flaws with that logic. So I just want to uh, I can, bring I can to attest to part of that. I think yeah, I made more money when I was 19 working for Ford than I will see for at least a few more years. Yeah, and it, even if you take in the college loan, the student loan debt and all of that, the real facts are it's the type of person who goes to college, who might go to college, is more likely to make more money than those who aren't. And if you study those who uh, were going to go to college and got a degree versus didn't, uh, you'll often find the person who didn't go to college made more. So I just like to uh, have caution for statistics like that because they're thrown around often in places and, like where I work. And I'd like, I'd like to have caution for why we base our, why we base success on how much money we make. I mean, we Great all know point. That yeah. make a lot of money and they're not happy, you know, so that, that is not what our soul is asking for. So why we even pretend that the statistics are right for something we don't even believe in, I, you know. Yeah, that, that's a, a really good point, um, and I agree with that also. So, I mean, if we look at success from school, we should be looking at not just financial success, but also happiness, satisfaction, et cetera. Um, and also the fact that many people don't go into the field that they graduated college from, and many of those who do are not happy with what they're doing. Um, and then another point that was brought up is many people spend their entire time in college like I did and graduate with nothing real to show for it. And I think that's a huge problem. Like we need to have real uh, products to show for our experience in college. And I don't believe school should have require people to do fake work. And I think that's useless. So that is something that I hope needs to, that I hope will end and our work publicly and there's not any means for that. I keep meeting all these college graduates who can't get jobs and I ask them, what's your digital footprint? Show me your online portfolio. And this is nothing that colleges believe is a part of their job at all. And they're getting all these people just going there because they think they need to. And, uh, and that's why I'm hoping Rad Matter will let people credential themselves because colleges are popping out and not doing what they need to do to prepare people to really have success in the world, just meaning that they find work that they love, they're satisfied, and they can, you know, pay rent and eat. Yeah. Just a little have a real, a real life ongoing resume, I think is what you're saying. Yes, it's exactly. Yes. I think you'll be really happy to see Red Matter. Yeah, I will. I hope. Well, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to allude to an earlier point in that. Uh, when I got out of school, I had got my psychology degree and I did a year of research. And after the first two months, I said, oh, this is cool. I can sit down at work for the first time since I was like 16 and working. And then after the third month, I was like, why am I sitting down all the time? And one of my bosses actually said something to me there. We were having a conversation about, I don't know, this, that, and the other. And to do something that you're passionate about. And right now, I cook for a living but I have plenty of time to do all of the other things that I'm passionate about and I'm able to pay rent. And it's just, it's a simple equation for me. Um, but I think that the, the idea that you have to have a job just to have a job, if it takes up 80 hours of your week and it's just a job, that's, I don't know, it's not the existence for me. I mean, a lot, most of the research that we've done are on first-generation college students, rural, lower socioeconomic class. And, you know, there's something really special about um, the situation that they're in, and, and they have such grit and drive that I think um, people who grew up with a little bit more privilege you know, sort of lack that, that uh, willingness to go do whatever it's going to take. I mean, we met we met students that were, you know, living in a car. Now, these are not always traditional students. And by the way, the traditional path is not a four-year path. So, I mean, we met a mom who was living in her car with her kids and doing online courses at the library to get her degree. And she got her degree and she got a job. Like, there are 
definitely stories like that and I, I just I don't want to forget that you know that there is for some portion of society it's really important that they do get the degree I think we also at the same time need to pursue the other path so that it's really a choice it's not quite there yet that's yeah, a good point, Catherine. I think in saying nothing is for everyone, we need to make sure we, we're, we're living that and not saying nothing is for everyone. So don't do that. I mean, that doesn't right. even make sense. There's also, are we, what, seven people here with college degrees? Whether we like it or not? Yeah. We right. All them, right? But I think for me, it, it didn't help. And I just hurried up and got it done. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I got it done at 19 and I had no... I mean, many people I write about I think this you all were the time a trooper, Lisa. have gotten their degree and had no direction, or aren't rich. Yeah, in, in the monetary to that, sense. To, right. dry, to try to draw this to a close, um, I, and I want to I want to start with Phil. And Phil, could you tell us where to get your book again, and uh, just. Any last thoughts you have? We'll just go around and get last thoughts here, and then we'll, it's one way to for us to end. But Phil, go there ahead. Is a, there's a buy the book page on my website, which is philpappas.com. Two uh, P's in Pappas, right? Or three yeah. P's in Pappas. Three P's and in Pappas L's and, and two L's in Phil. There you okay. go. <laughs> um, but, uh, and it's on Amazon. Um, it just came out about last week um, and I'm also again. say what say the title again uh, the title is one page at a time getting through college with ADHD Great. Joe Beard and uh, yes no no I'll, I'll get I forgot Alex was there too sir Phil did, did you finish were you gonna say something else I'm sorry oh no I was just gonna say that uh, this has been very interesting <laughs> Go team. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> Alex, uh, s spell the name of your site again. And uh, wh when yeah, can we uh, look for it to come to New York sure City thing. and Colorado? It's uh, and our school, H O U R school dot com. Um, and would love to get anybody's feedback on the site. Uh, again, well, we're going to have a new site up probably at the beginning of November. So that's really the one. Um, that I'd like everyone to go and play with once that up. I'll send out a note to everyone. Um, yeah, any comments would be much appreciated, and it's been fun. Thank you. Cool. We'd love for Rad Matter too, by the way. We'd love to have this show be a place where people could come on and. Did we answer your question? Yes. About your yes, sister. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, I think that that's still a learning process for her and for me too, for everybody, because it's it's an individual. Um, way of finding one's passion or interest or something and uh, she's just enjoying her life right now cool thanks you're welcome back anytime of course Catherine you have any last thoughts or what are you thinking here yeah I mean um, <laughs> last thoughts I you know I I would just say to everyone um, you know to think about, look at the gaming world more, and and uh, I really believe that we're all on our own epic adventure. That we're all superstars, geniuses. Um, there's something. There's a reason why we're all here, and um, and you know this life is not, um, you know, I guess the way I'd say it is not punitive, right? Like you, we're always moving forward. It's not going back. So if if you know, anywhere in the in the process, we don't feel challenged or excited. It's not like you're losing points or losing time. It's just an opportunity or an awareness to move forward and say, what's the next level of my game and how am I going to get there and, and what's that about and what kind of magic can I make in the world and what's going to really turn me on. So um, I'm super psyched to talk with all of you and I hope that we can keep in touch and kind of um, collaborate on on you know, bringing the game of you to life and whether that's rad matter or for anyone individually. It's something you said way at the beginning, you mentioned challenges, not chores, um, mm -hmm. would be a great thing for teachers to keep in mind. So thanks for that idea. <laughs> Lisa, sure. any final thoughts or can we count that? Well, you, go ahead, Lisa, what's up? 
Uh, no, I mean, I think I, I had, uh, yeah, you had those a lot of the four. <laughs> oh, I couldn't hear you. It cut out. I'm sorry. What did I you said, say? I, the last comment you had, you had uh, a very clear three-point presentation there. <laughs> yeah, so I think I'll, I'll end with that. And just I do hope that people keep the conversation going with me um, on Facebook. My name's Lisa Velmer Nielsen there on Twitter at Innovative EDU or follow my blog, The Innovative Educator. I love uh, engaging in these discussions with and your people book again, like those who are here today. The title oh, of your and book yes, again. I just published a book called Teaching Generation Text, and you can order that from my blog or teachinggenerationtext.com. Great. So I have nothing left. <laughs> I, Monica, you have any thoughts here as we're closing? Not to be redundant, but I think it's so important. I'd like to end again with Steve Jobs' quote, um, life is limited, um, so don't spend it being someone else. And then Oscar Wilde, that most people are other people. And so let's encourage people to be free to be themselves and, and create more spaces of permission. Cool. And I don't know exactly Guys, where this – where this is going to go next week, but I'm totally fascinated by what we're learning from the Occupy folks, and what what uh, you know what that's teaching us about learning, <laughs> and groups getting together and so forth. So I'd, I'd love to talk about that more next week. That's just one thought. Um, Monica, well, we you'll be here in New York. But New yeah. York next week, so we might even you know check that you can out. Broadcast live, them down there. I don't know <laughs> if we'll be here. On, online or not so right cool um thanks and I do want to say online here we uh just need to identify that we've been broadcasting here at edtechtalk.com which is a network on or a channel on the network of 